Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. This is a major pre-migration roost for the purple martins. It's like a hurricane of birds. Our basic goal to get more teenagers and young adults outside. The average age of somewhere in the park is like 45, so they're kind of freaking out about that. If you'll sit and talk to the kids and listen to them, they'll pretty much tell you what they would like to see and how they would like to see it. I never dreamed that, you know, when I was starting out that, that someday I would I'd earn over a million dollars bass fishing. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. Oh, look, there's Haymont. Andy and Julia Belinsky are landlords in Austin. In January, we get these housing units all ready. Today, they are checking on the welfare of some tenants. Hey, Haymont. With their friend Haymont, they manage a housing complex. We have to clean them out. We have to uh, purchase new structures from time to time some maintenance. But all this happens on a small scale. The three are landlords for a colony of purple martins. They are the largest North American swallow, a subgroup of that family called the martins, which are a type of swallow. However, unlike some swallows, which raise young in houses they construct themselves, purple martins need existing cavities in order to nest. So the birds have become increasingly reliant on people to provide housing. It's a relationship that dates back centuries. Native Americans put up gourds long, long ago, and this, this bird associates safety with humans. Humans keep the snakes away. There are fewer snakes and hawks and owls, so they just more or less refuse to nest away from human activity. Landlords know many ways to deter predators, and they also know how to evict bad neighbors. Take it out. Without some help, the martins would be run out of their homes by non-native birds like house sparrows. They're pretty nasty. They'll go in and peck the purple martin eggs. They'll be mean to the babies. It's bad news, so we discourage them from being here. And that's the part of the responsibility. Sparrow nests are easy to spot but no one wants to evict babies. No eggs. So landlords must remove nests frequently during the spring. So we're done here. We live 20 minutes away, but we do try to make it every five days, if, if at all possible. Purple Martins also do some traveling. They spend winter in South America and return to North America each spring to breed. Reaching Texas in late January and February, and as far north as Canada by May. Landlords lay out the welcome mat by offering clean, vacant, semi-furnished units. We put a bed of pine needles in each compartment, and when the nesting starts, they, the purple martins themselves will bring leaves. After that, the real work begins. How, how many eggs did we have in F? We pull their nests down and count eggs. Seven, still seven. Native birds are protected by federal and state laws, so eggs and nestlings should not be handled without proper training and permits. But careful nest checks can benefit purple martins. Some of it is actually directly helping the martins, like sometimes we have to throw out a rotten egg that could break and bring some disease or change out a nest that's crawling with mites. We not only help birds in raising the family, but also we help the scientific community to gather data. 
The information these and many other landlords collect is passed along to the Purple Martin Conservation Association to yield a better understanding of species health and management across its range. I'm not a scientist myself, but this is a chance to be a citizen scientist. All right, now we leave them alone. And they're coming back? And they're coming back. Clearly being a landlord takes some work. So since the birds pay no rent, what exactly are the dividends? Listen to this song. It's just a magical sound. They have so many different sounds. Just up the road in Temple, Alan Newman has been enjoying Purple Martin's song for more than two decades. I've been a Purple Martin landlord for 24 years. Right now I have 83 young ones and 54 adults. They're talking to their young. They're telling them to keep their heads down, to behave. <laughs> They're a, a good bird to have. Now, they don't get the ground mosquitoes, but they'll get a lot of other insects as they feed. I just enjoy being around the birds, and it's really nice seeing all that new life generated year after year. Oh, look at you, sweetie babies. Back in Austin, those eggs have yielded newborn martins. When they unfold out of that egg, even on the day they hatch, they don't seem to fit. <laughs> Within a month, even the tiniest of these hatchlings will be learning to fly. By summer's end, the birds will head south. But before they leave, the martins put on an impressive show in Austin. When the babies have all fledged, the purple martins from further north of here they congregate at Highland Mall for about a month. It's amazing. They come in on the same trees every day. In July, purple martins converge nightly on a few trees in this North Austin parking lot. They're starting to come in like right now. This is a major pre-migration roost for the purple martins. After they've raised their babies, they start grouping up into large groups in preparation for flying south to South America. Wow, this is so incredible. The community of birds also draws a community of onlookers. Ooh, I see one. At its peak, the spectacle rivals Austin's famed bat colony. We've had numerous people tell us this is cooler than the bats. It's so big, you can see it on Doppler radar. Pretty impressive. There's like layers upon layers of them. Though Andy, Julia, and Haymont lost some of their Martin babies to an extreme June heat wave, their caring management helped dozens more survive. 172 birds basically are out here, new birds this year, because of that colony that we took care of. So we definitely are responsible for some portion of that. I'm sure our birds are among these. Those three, that one, that one, on the, uh, that one <laughs> the 700th one from the left. It's like a hurricane of birds. And perhaps here too are some future caretakers. Mom, this is really cool. To help ensure these birds will always have a place to call home. Oh, whoa. That is a lot of birds. That's really cool. Mic test, one, two. Good morning. How are you doing, baby? How are you? He's definitely one of the nicest people. The kids just love him to death. Good morning. Good morning, girls. Good to see you. Charlie Wilson. How you doing? He makes them fun all the time. He's sassy sometimes. He's a force of nature. <laughs> Pull! What am I? I am the uh, shooting sports specialist for Texas Parks and Wildlife. I got to look at my card. I'm not even sure what. <laughs> I drive the truck, I ride the quad, I throw the targets. Charlie Wilson is indeed a force of nature. While he hasn't been the only one involved, 
he has definitely been the driving force behind Texas Parks and Wildlife Department's very successful shooting sports program. Number four going straight up. Set your face. Since 1992. See there? Mm -hmm. Charlie has traveled the state with a truck and a trailer. He teaches folks, most of whom have never picked up a firearm in their lives, how to handle a shotgun. Paul! How to shoot a shotgun. And most importantly, how to be safe with a shotgun. Follow it in, follow it in, take it. Good shot. Nothing to this, is it? Nothing to this. Let's try this again. I'm on my second generation of shooters now, kids that started with the program back in the early 90s. I'm seeing their kids now. On behalf of Texas Parks and Wildlife, Texas FFA, I'd like to welcome everybody here to the sixth annual Ag Clays 381 shootout. Six years ago, we had 60 kids come shoot. We had eight schools. Oh. This year, we've got 612 entries. Mom, remember 35. Okay. Yeah. 41, 41, I 35. Does he want anything? Yep. You sure? Yeah. With the kids, he develops long-term relationships where, you know, 500 kids all feel like he, he cares about them personally, and he does. He follows them through school. Those kids still send him cards. They come see him after they're in college, after they're out of college. He's made lifelong participants in the outdoors through shooting sports out of these kids. It's really an amazing thing. Boy, what happened to your teeth? <laughs> Have you been kissing girls? <laughs> I, I think we get into a, into a trap that we don't, as adults, we seem to think that we know what's always right and what's best for the kids and what the kids want. And I've found that if you'll sit and talk to the kids and listen to them, they'll pretty much tell you what they would like to see and how they would like to see it. I always come try and find him as soon as I get to a shoot. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. He's the Pied Piper of the shooting sports. All right, you ready? <laughs> Seventeen-year-old Natalie Davis loves making movies. She hopes to inspire her generation to spend time in nature. And she's reaching them one like at a time. She's the Texas State Parks Youth Ambassador, a crew of volunteers aged 16 to 28. It's an internship with Texas Parks and Wildlife, and our basic goal being to get more teenagers and young adults outside, because the average age of someone in the park is like 45, so they're kind of freaking out about that. The ambassadors aim to give parks a fresh look. They like adventure. They like adventure and excitement. And that's exactly what Natalie hopes to convey in her video. Be at your door tonight if you need help. Because I think a lot of teenagers have the perception of, you know, um, just like going on this really long, hot, boring hike. Uh, you notice how, how it grows in such... And like having someone tell you all the different animal species and plants. It has this lacy pattern. But I think if we can show them adventure and kind of exploring, I think that will instill a love of nature in them and that'll, in the long term, pay off. Youth ambassadors have come up with other creative ways to get people to parks. One of our ambassadors hosted a concert in the park. The music event, I got people saying, I've never been in this park before. You get to see pictures on Facebook of your friends in the park, and it just feels amazing that you did something. I want to get a feel the for ambassadors what bounce ideas off mm -hmm. each other, learning as they go. Um, or anything else you need right now to feel ready to dive into this role. The ambassador program is kind of a choose your own adventure program. Every one of our ambassadors is learning to create and see an idea through to completion. I was able to visit like a lot of different state parks. It's helped me a lot with um, being able to present my ideas to people, whether it's through videos or through um, outreach events. I've gotten a lot better at just um, basic mar marketing skills and trying to appeal to people. As members of the digital generation, the state parks youth ambassadors have a lot of competition for attention. The biggest challenge is going to get them to unplug from their iPods and their iPhones and their i-whatevers and just getting them outside. So they're reaching out to their generation on their own terms. Where is that? In Chandler. Okay. 
Oh, that's awesome. Wow. I'll love you long after you go, go, go. This is the Super Bowl of Baffin. Yeah. Don't hustle. This is going to be a tournament like you've never seen before. For the first time ever, the state's premier Big Bass Lake, Lake Four, is the site of a major fishing tournament. Jersey Boy in Texas, right there. The Toyota right. Texas Bass Classic. Yeah. You got it. 160 of the best bass pros fishing for a million dollar purse. Well, you got to sign my shirt. I'll be happy to. That's Alton <laughs> Jones, one of the favorites. I chose y'all for the team to win. Did you really? Well, I appreciate that. Hey, how are ya? And this is Darren Schwankbeck, a tournament newcomer. Pronounce your last name. Schwankbeck. Schweko? Schwankbeck. Schwankbeck? <laughs> Good enough, man. Dude, Good that enough. is crazy. I love that hey, name. Hey. Shorty. <laughs> Shorty. <laughs> Ow! Nice to meet you. Yeah, great. These are two pros at different stages in their careers. We'll follow them both through Lake Fork's first Bass Classic. It's the day before the tournament. The top pros like Alton Jones All right, ready? rub shoulders with event sponsors as part of a pro-am. I'm going to try to get through on this side of it. I think there's an old pond in here. Darren, meanwhile, gets familiar with Lake Fork. Now well, we're going to get wedged on that one. <laughs> Alton has home field advantage being from Waco and it turns out he's pretty good when it comes to fishing to pay the bills. It's been a lot of fun. I've been fishing professionally now since 1990. I never dreamed that you know when I was starting out that that someday I would I'd earn over a million dollars bass fishing you know. Now we just travel around and all over the United States and and fish bass tournaments and it's pretty fun. Well I don't think uh, I don't think that one counts, does he? There's one. All right. Across the lake, Darren gets more time to practice. Yeah, we just call it practice, and a lot of people think that's pretty funny. You're practicing fishing. What do you mean practicing? <laughs> this is Darren's second year as a pro. He hasn't finished in the money yet this year, and the cash is running out. Without making those cuts and, and not getting uh, paychecks, uh, it's a tough road and, and there's some guys that may not survive and it's where I stand and I'm going to have to get my act together and start catching them the next few to uh, keep on going. It doesn't bode well then that this is new untested water for Darren and apparently there's new unknown critters as well. That's a beaver. I think that, that there's a the big beaver over there that looks like a baby. Or is it? Maybe that isn't a beaver. Look at the tail on it. It's not a beaver. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Pretty cool looking. Fortunately, as far as practice goes, see the big one over on the bed? Finding bass isn't a mystery. There's one. There's one. Yep. Well, it ain't big, but that's what that's what it's all about, just trying to locate them. So who knows? Maybe uh, maybe mama's around somewhere. For the cities around the lake, this tournament means money. Millions of dollars brought into the bait shops, restaurants, Here we are. and lodges. Good afternoon, Oak Ridge. The Bass this Classic is, is big business. I uh, love it. Love it. And it's all the buzz. Boat seven. We'll ease your way on through there. Boat seven. Can't wait to see the weights. That's, that's the main thing. See what them big you know, the big boys can actually do with our little lake. Well, 19, I got you one nine. Cloudy and cold conditions kicked off day number one. Let's rock and roll, we'll see y'all at four o'clock. I'll start flipping that stuff then. At most tournaments, each pro fish on their own. Here, the anglers are paired up. I mean, any stump you can see, you know, I mean, it, you just don't know which one he's gonna be on. Captain Jeff Crete gets the team on the board with a three-pounder. Easy. And Darren eventually follows with another. I was wondering why they ain't eating this thing. I'm like, come on. There she is. I got At the same time, Alton's team seems to have no problem. You know, it's nice having 
two pros in the boat. I can just concentrate on an outside line or an inside line and he can do the opposite and we can really, we can really cover an area thoroughly and fish faster through it. Two, four. This is a one-of-a-kind tournament, and conservation is key. Here at the Toyota Texas Bass Classic, the fish are caught, weighed, and then immediately released. Um, instead of these anglers bringing large numbers of fish to the scales and be weighed on stage, what they'll actually be doing is weighing the fish in the boat. Five? Yep. Um, so the fish are going to be cared for. They're in perfect shape. Five even. Thank you, fish. For Darren and Jeff, the day has been slow. Mix two amped up anglers and some rain, you get a stressful situation. I saw her. She's fixing to get she it, She flared up. Get in there on her, dude. Uh, get in front of her. I mean, you need to catch this fish. Well, nah, get, to get your a real bait in there, dude. Come on. We ain't got time to for the sink of. Catch that son It's right there, dude. I'll catch it in five flips. After day one, huh? Alton's team is in first place. What's up, boys? Well, we didn't match what y'all did, but, uh, but we did what we wanted to do. We did what we wanted to do. This tournament is a team format. There are 40 teams, each made up of four anglers. Right before you get to that first boathouse. Darren and his crew are in 35th place, 54 pounds behind the leader. Getting ready to pack our bags and head out of town here. <laughs> we still got some work to do, but maybe we'll make some, make, make some ground tomorrow and make some money. Following the lake regulations, the pros can bring in one fish over 24 inches. And that makes for some excitement. Yes. Back at the dock. Give it up, another one over. Wow. And up on stage. But the health of the fish is top priority. Nice job, Cody. The anglers themselves will put the fish in the way, these weigh bags, and the weigh bags will be used to transport the fish to these large tanks that we have in the back of these pickup trucks. So once the fish gets in those tanks, they're great for the transport to the stage. Show them to the crowd. Y'all give it up for another over right there. Once we finish the weigh-in session, we'll take the fish and we'll monitor them and take them out to the lake and restock them back in the water. When the day is done, Alton and Darren have quite at. different accommodations. The Jones family travels together in this stylish RV. Good girl. Did you get them? I got two. While well, Darren cuts cost by bunking up with another pro. And let's just say this bird's nest is nothing. We've been on the road now for two months, and we're still just total chaos right now, disorganized. And I mean, there's clothes, everything's just a, a mess. As for tomorrow? Because you stress out so bad about it. Both so. could use a big payday. It's crazy to be out here and just spend, a, you know, it's a small fortune. It's the fastest way to go broke, you know? And I tell my friends that want to do it, you know you don't, I mean, I don't want to see them lose their butt sort of like we have or, uh, or go through the, the stress and stuff because it is like the most stressful thing I've ever done. Welcome back to Lakeport, Texas where the fish are big, really big, and we have seen that so far. There ought to be some on, this, on these trees, you'd think. Unfortunately for Darren, day number two proves just as frustrating as day number one. That looks like a fish right there. No, it's just grass. There she is, coming right on it right now. You're right on her back right now. Yeah, I'm gonna catch this fish. Come on, eat the damn thing. Across the lake, it's a little <laughs> different for Team Alton. There she is, I got her. You know, it's funny how your demeanor changes. You know, when you catch a couple of good ones and you realize, hey, what the plan we've got is working, you really start bearing down and, and working and fishing hard and concentrating on that next bass. Yeah, good day. In the end, Alton's team took second place. Way to go, Russ. While Darren finished in 22nd. Yeah, it's a rough road. <laughs> there's no doubt about it. It starts to take its toll after uh, several tournaments, and there's not a whole lot of security in it. And without cash and checks, it's a tough road. So head to Augusta next and hopefully uh, putting things in high gear.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram.